Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Black Person of Color BPOC panel for Copenhagen 2021 uh, World Pride during the Human Rights Forum. We're pre-recording today on July 28th to be prepared for a later August presentation, like so many of the panelists around the globe that are dealing with the global pandemic. We have a star-studded panel of activists who have come together over the course of the past few months to organize for World Pride, uh, the BPOC delegation. And before we get to our participants, our panel, we just wanna introduce our topic. And our topic is the language we use, uh, global pride and black erasure. And you know, over the course of this next 45 minutes, I think that what you'll get is a candid fireside chat with LGBTQIA activists from the African diaspora about their experiences with gender, being same gender loving, queerness, and the fractured effort to produce a global LGBTQIA plus, <laughs> that's a lot, political lexicon. I think that you will find that throughout the globe, uh, in the global south, in the west, in the far east, where black people exist, we acknowledge our identities quite differently per our political and cultural and faith-based factions. And before we again dig into the panel and I hand over the proverbial mic, I'd just like to say that as a data rights activist, along with uh, human rights and LGBTQ rights activists, uh, I think it is necessary to acknowledge that the way that we collect personal data in particular about our identities, about our bodies, about our lived experiences is increasingly important if we are going to lobby and legislate inclusion across the board. Uh, to go a bit further, I would like everyone to sort of go with me down the rabbit hole of a thought experiment that suggests that language is in fact our oldest technology. If we think about technology and three, the three rigid forms that it exists in being methodologies, hardware, and software, or processes human makes, things that we can touch that humans make, and things that we can't touch that humans make. Uh, the oldest sorts of technologies would be language first, let's say sticks or wheels second. And last but not least, let's call fire our oldest software. So that's our oldest methodology, our oldest hardware, and our oldest software. And if we're going to acknowledge how we build a more robust, inclusive environment across the globe for any of us to exist, I think we first have to start by acknowledging the language that we use about ourselves and rigidly identifying ourselves in the political lexicon that regulates how we exist in the world across our nations and states and um, collective of nation and states that we see coming together here uh, this August for World Pride in Copenhagen. So that was probably a bit of a mouthful, but back to the language we use. I think we're gonna start this, this panel off with Richard Bell, who is in the Western United States as we make our way uh, around the globe. So I'll just uh, hand it off to Richard and we'll go from there. Thank you, sir. So my name is Richard Brether Bell. I am the um, Director of Diversity and Inclusion for Albuquerque Pride in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I am also the Community Outreach Director for El Paso Sun City Pride in El Paso, Texas. We're actually a lot closer than people might think, <laughs> neighboring um, states, so not too far to get from one to the other. Um, for Interpride, I am the Human Rights and Diversity uh, Co-Chair. So um, what, are we moving on to the next person you want me to get started? I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, you can go. You <laughs> okay. <laughs> right in. Yep. Okay. So um, there are basically three uh, topics that, that I wanted to cover um, and that they're all revolve around systemic racism, but we'll talk about critical race theory, um, the effeminate male and police brutality. So when it comes to critical race theory, I don't know um, how many who are outside of the US have heard about this endeavor, but it's been going on a long time in the US. It's been taught in colleges and universities, 
since the early 70s. In fact, the first, um, I believe the first class of it was taught by the first Black um, instructor at Harvard University in, in the early uh, 1970s, um, Professor Bell. So no relation, not that I'm aware of. But um, so it's, it's not anything new, but what often happens with uh, critical conversation pieces is that they float around, they're known within certain communities and finally make their way to the mainstream. Unfortunately, the way that critical race theory or CRT has made its way to the mainstream is so many people, predominantly white Americans fighting against it. So what is CRT? So critical race theory is a body of legal scholarship and an academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists in the United States. They seek to uh, critically examine US law as it intersects with issue of race in the mainstream. So basically this is a, a critical examination of contributing factors to systemic racism. There are essentially five components of critical race theory. One, the notion that racism is ordinary and not um, aberrational or departure from the norm. Two, the idea of, uh, of an interest convergence. Three, the social construction of race. Four, the area of storytelling and counter storytelling. And five, the notion that whites have actually been recipients of civil rights legislation. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of blowback from this and uh, there are many people who don't want this taught in school, um, but we cannot have a legitimate conversation about systemic racism without talking about the contributing factors of uh, systemic racism. And one being that race itself is a social construct. It's just kind of make believe a way of assigning people to their prospective places on the social hierarchy. And in the US, there are um, five kind of main instances of this idea of, the, of race being a social construct. construct. Number one is the Dred Scott case that basically legalized segregation by um, determining that Negroes, as Black people were called at the time, were not citizens, therefore didn't have the rights of other uh, um, white citizens. So um, that is how we ended up with legal segregation. And two, you may not have heard of this, um, but most Americans have, especially Black Americans, and that is the one drop rule where it was a, theorize that if you, or legalize rather, that if you had one drop of black blood in your system, then you were rendered black. Therefore, at the bottom of the social hierarchy, regardless of what you look like or how you identify your ethnicity. Three, in 1935, minorities were denied social security and excluded from unions. In 1935, Congress passed two laws that protected American workers, but excluded non-whites. This was the Social Security Act, which exempted agricultural workers and domestic servants, which were predominantly African Americans, uh, Mexicans, and Asians from receiving old age pension or old age insurance. The other, the Wagner Act, guaranteed workers' right, but it did not prevent unions from discriminating against um, non whites. And so non whites were locked out of higher paying jobs and benefits of job security and Medicare. Um, number four, in 1934, the U.S. housing pro programs benefited whites only. So these were programs that provided low income um, housing um, for Americans, predominantly white Americans. Uh, Non-whites were uh, left out of this. And then one of the things that is just particularly disturbing, of course, there's many, but that would be um, the Bracero program and Operation Wetback. So uh, during World War II, in order to make sure that we were able to provide food for a nation, um, the United States brought in between four to five million um, Mexicans um, to work and help provide food for Americans and their families. But of course, once the war was over, these, uh, um, these amazing people who came and helped this country out so much were sent back to Mexico. They were deported. 
That's one of the reasons why we have such an issue with deportation in this country now. There's a long history that so many people are not aware of, of how we treated people that we invited to essentially save our lives, to save our country. And then when we were done with them, we got away, um, we sent them back. And even the term wetback, which is basically a term um, for Mexicans who uh, apparently or allegedly came into the country illegally. So it's a disgusting term and it's a disgusting thing that we have done to this country, but it's examining these things, these aspects of history and how they contribute to systemic racism. Another issue we wanted to talk about is the effeminate male and why is this such a big deal? Well, first of all, uh, effeminacy is the manifestation of traits of in a boy or man that are um, stereotypically or traditionally um, female identify. So female behavior, feminine behavior, mannerism, style, or gender, those kind of things that are traditionally female. When men take on these mannerisms, these ideologies, um, they're called effeminate. Um, as someone who identifies as an effeminate male, we are, we are seen as somehow less than. And the reason being is because we live in a patriarchal society that sees women as somehow less than. So you see that there's this, there's this um, uh, criticism of femininity in any form. Um, but this is, it becomes a problem when it takes on or becomes part of toxic masculinity which uh, involves culture and pressures for men to behave in a certain way. Um, it refers to the notion that the ideal of masculinity or manhood is manliness, manliness, domination, homophobia, aggression, those kind of things. And this is adversely, uh, women and effeminate men tend to be adversely affected by this kind of behavior. This affects society that when men Act, actively avoid vulnerability, act on homophobic beliefs, ignore personal traumas, or exhibit prejudiced behaviors against women or um, effeminate men or men they uh, determine are gay. These, this contributes to many large societal problems such as gender-based violence, homophobia, uh, violence, so sexual assault, um, gun violence. So toxic masculinity is, um, Oftentimes, we see those of us who are part of marginalized uh, communities, we receive this from those within our own community. One of the reasons being that for a lot of non-white people, they feel that the white man can take everything away from them, but what you can't take away is my manhood. So when you see a man behaving in a way that is deemed feminine, then he is someone uh, many believe is surrendering his manhood, therefore making all of us more vulnerable to um, abuse and to discrimination. And lastly, I want to talk about police brutality. As this is our community, whether it's the Black community, whether it's the LGBT plus community, is often out adversely affected by police brutality. From my personal experience, I, I was raised in Los Angeles, in South Central Los Angeles, and I was... Um, about 20 years old when I saw that video of Rodney King uh, beaten. Um, to see something like that where this unarmed Black man was beaten multiple times and tased and the police who did this, were, they were acquitted of it, which is how we ended up with the, um, what is called the LA riots or the Rodney King uh, riots. I was in LA at that time. And I remember as a young man, 20, 21 years old, it's dehumanizing to see. And you recognize that they can do whatever they want to us and not face any accountability. Well, that was 1992. Then we fast forward to George Floyd and we're seeing the same thing take place. It's clear we haven't learned from history as a society because we repeat it. Um, we saw the um, George Floyd on video having the life snuffed out of him. And even at the time that there were, this was going on, there were those who felt that, well, what did George do? I mean, what did Floyd do? What led to the police doing this? In reality, there is nothing a human being can do to justify that kind of abuse, that kind of 
murder, that kind of dehumanization, that violation of his civil rights. There is nothing a person can do. If this was an animal, if this was a dog, there would be much more uproar. Also, at the time, I was uh, part of the Enterprise Human Rights and Diversity um, Committee, and we talked about whether or not we should make a statement condemning police brutality. And someone who's part of the dominant caste uh, mentioned that this is something that takes place in the US or North America, and that absolutely is not the case. So I want to give attention to Erica to talk about, and I hope I say this name correctly, but Adama Troy and talk about what happened there so that we can have a better understanding that this systemic part of racism, police brutality, is not limited to North America. Erica. Thanks, Richard. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel. Um, so it's Adama Traoré. Uh, but before I jump into it, I, wanna, I want also to head back to your portion on critical race theory. Um, I'm Erica Werner. I am the membership service uh, manager at EGID, which is the Francophone International Network of LGBT organizations. And um, on late June, um, our, my, our organization um, hosted a three-day international conference um, bringing together uh, civil society, uh, academics, and institutions to talk about the state of queer rights in the Francophone setting or Francophone spaces. And one of the subjects that came up the first day was the issue or of the movement or the relationship of the movement with colonialism and the language we use and how it is important to reclaim erased history, to unlearn um, the portions that were fantasized about you know, the movement in the global south, and also recognize that all the hardships that we have in the global south, which also is often mentioned as one unit, we are very diversified, we have very different cultures, queer culture has been existing in the global south for centuries, our history didn't start at Stonewall, <laughs> and our oppression didn't start at Stonewall, it started when basically the Europeans showed up. We were full members of society. And, and so uh, one of the roundtables that really resonated with a lot of activists and a lot of academics and research and work um, called for unlearning and learning again these histories in order for that solidarity or that movement, that global LGBTQIA plus movement to be effective. Because what we're seeing right now is some type of reproduction of, of the same errors that were done when we were labeling, categorizing, and, and ab being oblivious to existing identities already. So I just wanted to mention that. And um, with relations to pol police brutality, um, Times Magazine um, Guardian of the Year in 2020, her name is Asa Traoré. She's the sister of Adama Traoré. Um, she's French, um, family is Malian French. In 2016, Adama was arrested and um, died during the process of being arrested in very, very um, strikingly similar way as <laughs> George Floyd did. And five years in, we're still waiting for justice. I mean, there has been no process, no recognition of the issues. Um, and and uh, Asad Khaouhe is carrying a strong movement that pretty much brought, when George Floyd movement happened in the US, that brought back the trauma from Adama Traoré. And we were just emerging out of um, the first lockdowns and back into the streets. And what happened was just people in the streets um, asking for justice, asking for recognition of what happened in, in 2016. So um, it's not just a movement in the US. Police brutality is a reality wherever there is black or people of color. And it's even much more reality when you're part of that queerness that is marginalized, trans, um, you know, dark skin, um, people living with disability or special needs, um, intersex, you know, gender fluidity, et cetera. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a reality that we live with and it's something that needs to be included in the data and that needs to be decentralized. Yes, it, each continent, each um, um, community or each diaspora, as we mentioned earlier, has a different relationship with police and a different history with police brutality, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 
and that doesn't mean they should be ignored. And in every country in Europe, there is police brutality, there is data, there has been. So that's all I wanted to add about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's interesting, um, Erica, that um, when um, she was being interviewed, um, Troy As Asa, when she was being interviewed, uh, the day she was being interviewed by Time, there was a, a video recording of a black man who was a music producer being beaten by the police. It's like, come on. In his house, yes. In his, yes, this is so incredible. In his house and beaten him in his house. Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, it, you don't have to go through all that. I, I'm a grown woman. I live in a quiet neighborhood near the airport, but um, I would not dare go to the bakery that is 300 meters away or the pharmacy without my ID. I have been stopped, broad daylight, you know, just checked. It was nice, it was polite, it happened. But I really wonder if my, all my neighbors are conscious about having their IDs on them when they're just going for a quick run for croissant, you know? <laughs> or we need the morning baguette, very warm. But I do, I will not step out without it. So it is a reality and it has nothing to do with anything other than our history with racism, colonialism, slave trade, and all these biases that came from there. Um, so I'd like, uh, uh, sorry, Richard, I'm not sure if you, if you were done, but um, I, was, I was about maybe to um, introduce Alicia, because um, I think yes, she, um, uh, Alicia um, will be speaking in French, so I will be having that conversation with her, but um, she's an independent activist from uh, Quebec, Montreal, or, or who lives in Quebec, Montreal. And we'll be talking about another type of police brutality that Black trans women in those areas face and in the world. Um, alors, Alicia, je vais te laisser te présenter. Uh, merci beaucoup, Erika. <laughs> uh, bonjour tout le monde, bonsoir. Uh, mon nom, c'est Alicia Kasuvinka. Alors, euh, je suis euh, d'origine du Burundi, euh, c'est en Afrique, et euh, je suis canadienne aussi, euh, naturalisée, et euh, je vis ici depuis à peu près 14 ans. Et euh, je suis euh, conférencière, activiste et militante, et ancienne porte-parole pour la fondation Massimadi. Et euh, donc, je fais partie de vraiment, de mon implication date quand même d'à peu près presque 9 ans. Et euh, voilà, donc de fil en aiguille, euh, j'ai su euh, petit à petit prendre mes marques et mes repères. Donc, j'ai commencé dans le bénévolat, puis à être rendue aujourd'hui à une activiste indépendante. Donc, ça me fait très plaisir d'être là aujourd'hui. Très plaisir de te voir. Euh, Alicia, euh, pour un petit peu revenir sur ce que Richard disait, il parlait vraiment de, de tout ce qui s'est passé avec le mouvement Black Lives Matter et le, le dilemme pour les les personnes de la communauté LGBTQI euh, noire et de couleur pour faire euh, peut-être juste demander à des organisations internationales comme Interpride euh, de, de, de dire un mot ou de reconnaître les mouvements. Euh, mais là, j'aimerais que tu nous parles un petit peu de, du, peu, du travail que tu avais fait dans la même année où ces mouvements avaient pris une tournure un peu plus mondiale pour parler d'un détail que l'on avait un petit peu omis dans ce mouvement. Je, je reste un petit peu mystérieuse, mais tu, je ne voudrais pas trop spoiler. <rire> un événement qui s'est passé cette année? <rire> non, on parlait de, de l'année dernière, tu sais, avec Black Lives Matter, avec la, 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 la brutalité policière. Um, tu, tu, tu avais parlé de certains sujets qui étaient un petit peu omis concernant la communauté LGBTI, mm -hmm. euh, concernant le mouvement Black Lives Matter, c'est de ça que je voulais... Je voulais... Oui, tout à fait. Alors, euh, ça, il a été porté à mon attention et plusieurs fois euh, pour de nombreuses personnes et en général, en plus précisément des femmes trans noires. Euh, qui euh, ont plusieurs, entre, entre elles, ont perdu la vie. Euh, donc, elles ont été soit assassinées, tuées, et euh, malheureusement... ...a été passé euh, dans les nouvelles, donc c'est de la même façon que euh, la mort de George Floyd. Et euh, c'est quand même malheureusement dommage, puisque la... 
en général. Uh oh. Oh, did we lose her? No. Uh... En fait, de ces dates. Et uh, malheureusement, tout est là. Do you hear me? Oui, on t'entend. Ok, parfait. Ok, donc, um, comme j'expliquais tout à l'heure, uh, malheureusement, uh, la plupart ce sont des femmes trans uh, noires dues à la, aussi à la transphobie. Et uh, comme je parlé tout à l'heure, uh, Richard, de vraiment la toxicité masculine et vraiment, um, donc, de tout ce qui vient avec, uh, surtout en plus des people of color. Pas, euh, non, malheureusement pas eu une plus grande médiatisation, donc la plupart ou la quasi-totalité ont perdu la vie. Oui, oui et puis euh, Richard avait mentionné, euh, pardon, James avait mentionné que dans les données, on a du mal à reconnaître euh, la diversité, notamment quand il s'agit des personnes noires ou des personnes de couleur de la communauté LGBTQI, et, euh, et il me semble, tu me corrigeras si j'ai tort, mais il me semble aussi que la spécificité de l'incidence la, 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 euh, le plus élevé de, de, de cas de fatalité ou de, de, de crimes euh, fatals qui sont portés euh, et va vers les femmes trans noires en général, alors que lorsqu'on parle du Tidor, euh, on compte juste euh, par pays par exemple ou... Euh, voilà, donc c'est quand même intéressant. Euh, et donc le panel étant sur le, le langage qu'on utilise, euh, euh, j'aimerais te parler maintenant en tant que femme trans noire euh, venant du Burundi, euh, qui a grandi aussi en Afrique de l'Ouest, au Sénégal, dans un pays musulman, et qui atterrit au Québec, euh, qui porte sa voix. Euh, <coughs> On parlait d'identité, du langage, les, les, les étiquettes LGBTQIA+. Mm -hmm. euh, comment, comment tu vis ça Comment tu te retrouves là-dedans Qu'est-ce qui est important dans le langage qu'on utilise euh, Je trouve quand même que souvent, euh, dans, ces, dans toutes ces lettres de LGBTQIA2S+, souvent le T est mis sur silence et à la quasi-totalité et, euh, et ça peut se présenter sur différentes formes euh, il n'y a généralement pas de place pour les personnes trans généralement on n'invite pas les personnes trans euh, à pouvoir élever leur voix et parler de la réalité euh, généralement c'est plus d'autres personnes qui se chargent donc des personnes gays en général la plupart qui euh, se proclament euh, et vont parler à la place de la communauté, malheureusement, sans savoir les réalités euh, qu'on peut vivre au quotidien. Et euh, même dans la création, en fait, du LGBTQ, si on regarde vraiment au tout début, euh, le T est venu par après. Il y avait vraiment le G, le B, et euh, la lettre T aussi est vraiment à tout, plusieurs fois été marginalisée, mise de côté. Donc, et ça, et ça, se, ça se répète encore jusqu'à présent en 2021, euh, sans compter que vraiment, si on regarde depuis le début, donc la genèse de tout ça avec le Stonewall, euh, ce sont les femmes trans de couleur euh, pour la plupart qui ont milité pour euh, tous les droits que euh, la communauté a aujourd'hui. Donc, souvent, euh, ce qu'on oublie, euh, comme Martha P. Johnson, que, euh, la célèbre, que tout le monde connaît euh, euh, maintenant. Ouais. Euh, J'ai une toute petite dernière question. On a deux, deux trois minutes. Euh, C'est sur, toujours sur le langage. On avait eu une conversation il n'y a pas longtemps concernant la visibilité et notamment euh, certains incidents où cette visibilité est parfois euh, sur une ligne très fine, euh, synonyme à l'exploitation quand il s'agit des femmes trans noires. Et tu m'avais raconté une petite histoire assez intéressante et, et si, si tu le permets, est-ce que tu pourrais la partager aujourd'hui? Absolument, je trouve que je suis dans un safe space, donc euh, je trouve que je suis avec des gens ici qui sauront me comprendre et les internautes aussi. Alors, euh, ici au Québec euh, et au Canada, nous sommes très peu euh, de personnes euh, trans euh, noirs euh, par, comparativement à nos, à nos voisins euh, des États-Unis et encore plus des personnes qui sont impliquées euh, dans la communauté dans la cause. Donc, euh, 
Et ce que je trouve dommage et déplorable, c'est que euh, malheureusement, en... par plusieurs occasions, je me suis sentie utilisée euh, parce que je fitais avec euh, mes différentes oppressions, euh, que je sois noire, que je sois femme et que je sois trans, euh, ce qui répondait en fait à beaucoup de, de critères ou ce qu'on demandait dans, 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 dans plusieurs organismes. Euh, J'ai eu l'année passée à être invité à un événement où on devait à ce moment-là euh, faire un lancement euh, euh, d'une campagne. Et à ce moment-là, on m'avait invité, on m'avait dit que ma présence était nécessaire et que je représentais le côté francophone du Québec. Et surtout que je représentais aussi euh, la communauté noire. Donc, à ce moment-là, euh, je me suis passé, je suis venu et il y avait plusieurs dirigeants du gouvernement qui étaient présents pour le lancement. Malheureusement, je n'étais pas au courant que ces dirigeants-là allaient être présents. Et euh, le, le jour de l'événement, tout est arrivé, on, on a présenté l'événement, le lancement euh, du programme. Et euh, à la fin, il y a eu la séance photo et il a par ma grande surprise à rencontrer certains dirigeants que je, je n'étais en aucun cas euh, au courant de leur présence. Donc, dans, dans, mon, dans, mon, dans mon cas, moi, je me suis dit, ah, c'est un événement qui a pris une grande envergure. Donc, waouh, wow, quel plaisir de voir telle personne qui a fait le déplacement. Mais ce que je ne savais pas, c'est que euh, ma présence était nécessaire afin de représenter, en fait, euh, le Québec, euh, ben, le Canada, euh, dans, à l'échelle nationale et euh, d'avoir une représentation avec des people of color. Donc, j'étais cette personne-là euh, qu'on avait fait venir du Québec et en même temps aussi francophone, puisque le Canada est un pays bilingue. Donc, j'étais en fait ce joyau. Et à ce moment-là, euh, c'est bien plus tard par après que j'ai appris qu'il euh, y a eu un contrat et des postes qui ont été créés et euh, jamais on m'a convié à faire partie euh, du, du comité, jamais on m'a conseillé, on m'a invité à prendre place euh, aux discussions. Et en plus de ça, aucune rémunération n'a été, été versée. Donc, euh, donc, ça a été vraiment de l'exploitation sur l'exploitation sur l'exploitation. Et mmh. je pense que ça s'est revenu plusieurs fois sur différentes formes. Et c'est ce que je trouve malheureusement dommage, puisque ça se passe encore plus dans notre communauté. Comme, comme quand, par exemple, on vous invite et en échange, on vous offre la visibilité plutôt qu'une compensation pour le travail qu'on fait quand même. Euh... Oui, c'est un point très important. Je vais repartir en anglais pour, pour la dernière portion. Mais merci en tout cas, Alicia, d'avoir partagé ce moment avec nous. Um, and so, uh, Alicia was just mentioning, um, when it comes to language, uh, the thin line um, that comes between visibility and exploitation when it comes to queer, black, people of color being invited at events as being speakers and basically not being thought of as professionals and not being thought of as working people. Um, and um, this brings me really to that second, that last part of our conversation um, about the language we use. Um, it's, it's basically this, this consideration that diversity is, is a group and it has one model and it's a one thing and all together. Whereas within the diversity, we keep forgetting that there's even more diversity. And that when it comes to pride movements um, and the lexicon that we use LGBTQIA+, um, it's really difficult to see the diversity that comes with queer black pe or people of color. Um, I'll speak from my personal experience. I am um, Rwandan, Canadian, soon to be French. One day, the process is the longest of my life. <laughs> Six years strong, still waiting, it'll come. And um, um, I spent, though I was born in a country um, in Africa, in Burundi, and I grew up in Rwanda, I spent most of my adult life in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada, and um, my, identity, constructing myself as a queer person happened in English mostly and sometimes in French because bonjour les Franco-Ontariens, <laughs> we exist, it's not just Quebec. And um, 
this label system uh, was something I identified with and took a, a hard time, a long time to understand first, because, you know, as an immigrant, I was a refugee, LGBTQIA, what is this? Also, culturally speaking, um, in my country, we have two values that concern us. Number one, we're not individuals. So defining oneself as an I, a single individual is strange. We're individuals, we're part of a whole, but also our diversity is not defined by our intimacy, which is initially these labels were meant to um, label out everything that was outside of the binary when it comes to intimacy or gender, gender expression, and sometimes the body. And also we do not talk about our bodies. So we have, we are not individuals, we have decency and we have the sense of shame. And these apply to us as a community. And it was very difficult to find a letter that worked. And so um, with other friends and maybe, uh, maybe I don't know, Alicia, if that was the same experience for you, but we pick a default that is close enough um, to our identity. And when you're within the pride movement, I, that's not where I found other African people. I found them in other areas where safe spaces, or we call them caucuses, or those spaces where we need to meet and get together without being seen in order to work and define ourselves and refine our, our history. So, um, and these caucuses now are taking an, a certain importance and then being recognized. But when it comes to solidarity and the language we use and the labels we have, when we think about North South and we think about South as a whole, but there's South South, there is diaspora, there is descendants, there is diaspora within the South, there is people without a country. Um, we each have our own culture. We, that culture existed, I mentioned it before, it existed before. And it's hard for us to move within space, this global movements as activists uh, with preset labels when we're busy trying to find our erased history and our decency and reconcile all the values that make us whole as people from a certain country with a certain culture in a certain way. Um, and I think pride movements need to make space for that. They need to create these spaces within the events where we can gather without being seen together, where we can talk about these issues. And, you know, it's, it's about promoting queer culture. It's not just one culture, it's cultures. <laughs> and so I would love to go to a pride, um, event, if it's a global event, I would love to have an area that says, and I'm not asking for much, Africa, <laughs> for example. And Africans will understand that's still super like large, but even with that, I'll be content um, where we can go and speak um, and you know exchange and, and work the way we used to work because Globalizing a certain way of working, a certain way of speaking, labeling, advocating, etc., doesn't quite doesn't quite function. A lot of people are left behind. That's why we have still have marginalized people. That's why we still think of the South like a hostile area. They're hostile because some laws were created by people who came by boat. We were fine. Our women were not gendered. Um, we don't have pronouns that are gendered in my language. I can speak with activists for two hours, not know their gender, not know their sexual orientation. They still have dignity and they still have their decency. And we're working and we understand each other. We have social roles, we are recognized. And I can go back home, supposedly a hostile territory, but when I present myself or my queerness in my home language, my family, a Catholic family, mind you, doesn't mind at all. So how can pride show that? And how can we adapt the way we are doing our solidarity? How can we recognize that we need to adapt everything we have learned in our fight, in our pride, in our culture to make other cultures shine and maybe learn from other cultures? And um, I think with COVID, and I'll close on that when it comes to spaces that needs to be created for us. Uh, with COVID, we saw how important and how impactful safe spaces were 
and how threatened they became. In France, we are having a debate. Actually, there's a law that, that went through forbidding non-mixed spaces that we know. They call it non-mixed, but we call them caucuses. So <laughs> we're not allowed. We're still wondering what that entails. Um, does that mean that no. alcohol? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, 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 it's a law. You're not allowed to gather. And, yeah. and, and request that people who are not of a certain identity or are not concerned with the issue at hand um, do not attend. You have to be open to everyone. Yeah. So um, okay. think about gender-based violence, think about trauma, resilience, think about that whole um, purpose of transmission, um, mental health. Um, we couldn't even have this conference in, in France and have small caucuses no we cannot call it bpoc right. <laughs> we could have a, a conference on bpoc issues yeah. um, and just not not explicitly say that that you have to get out the room if you're not bpoc yeah. right or or you if you want to come stay quiet you know that whole the first time <laughs> i heard that i was like oh, i'm in heaven where is this what what is this legal um no well it's no longer legal it still happens though mind you of you know, we, we prevailed when things were worse, so. Yeah, no, I think, so, you know, we're, we're almost, we're almost at our, at our time. And um, I just think it's, it's so necessary to acknowledge, uh, again, the, the language that we use and, and how we differentiate, um, mainly because, uh, you know, I like to use this saying, you know, over here in, in the state side, again, being hyper Americana and and individualistic, but still acknowledging sort of the mesh of community that we live in. Uh, per word I like to use called inclusionism. The way I like to sum it up is that, um, at least from a socio-political standpoint, is that uh, individuals are at their best when they identify with a community and communities are only keyword at their best when they identify all of their individuals. And it sort of suggests this constant defining and refining of the narrow points of ourselves that participate and make the community whole. And that even as we grow, uh, even as there's just age diversity and us learning ourselves more and we bring more of ourselves to the table, that the community has to sort of endeavor to acknowledge us and scale as a result of us. And when we think about the world pride community, I can even say in my early experiences of, of trying to you know build out this working group, uh, it was difficult to settle even, and you all remember this, at least Richard and Erica, you remember this at the beginning, it was difficult to settle on the language BPOC because I just identify as, as just black. And the, everyone in the group, even while we, we've added the POC piece, which is a large tent for maybe people from the diaspora, maybe people who don't identify as being from the diaspora, there are black people in South America in the Arctic, in North America, on the African continent, in Asia, even East Asia, Black identifying folks. And when, for to add more color to everyone you know, viewing this at the World Pride event, we were troubled because there are working groups for the Latino population, for indigenous populations, for Asian populations, for Pacific Islander populations separately, and trying to identify sort of where we fit even as we are an increasingly, you know, diverse um, community. So uh, I think, again, it's just as we added very recently the black and brown stripes to the rainbow flag, which is apparently, and I'll just learn this this year, offensive to many Pacific Islanders who participate in the alphabet soup that is LGBTQIA+. Um, we're still trying to narrowly identify the, the person, the individual that we are bringing to the community, to, to use Erica's word, I'm, I'm taking notes as you're speaking. We're constantly identifying oh, that entity, say. right, oh. you're bringing, right. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, so just for, for housekeeping folks, we are gonna be available in, in real time, live in Copenhagen for Q and A, following this 45 minute panel, we're at about our last, uh, 60 seconds. So I'll, I'll shut up and just say, you know, Alicia or, or Richard, you want to add uh, any, anything in, in closing? 
Oh, no. no, no. Well, I would just say for, for my part, I this has been kind of a journey for our group. Um, and to get to this point, I'm so grateful for all of you. I've learned so much from, from each of you. I really have. And it means a lot to me and helps me to redefine how I see myself and the kind of man, the kind of queer man that I am. Um, I have a better understanding by my participation in this group. And you all know how I feel. I want this to keep going. I think we need this. So let's yeah. keep it moving. If we don't end at Copenhagen, we're going to keep doing it after this. I know we're going to Sydney next. We're going everywhere. And, and we'll do a whole bunch in between. Well, yeah, I know Erica has a lot to say about that. Well, just I just um, that's all I wanted to add. Um, this is the big I'm hoping that this is the beginning of an actual conversation and that black and uh, queer black and people of color in the world, wherever you are, I know you have something to bring to the table. And I know you have something to say about how we value our culture and how we need to diversify this global movement. So I'm hoping we get to meet and I'm hoping we get to talk, not just once a year or every two years. <laughs> so it's the beginning. Yeah. All right, so with that said, we're, we're gonna uh, end the video here. Again, uh, this video will go live at the Human Rights Forum and there will be another, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong, 30 to 45 minute Q&A following uh, this recorded session. So. So uh, thank you all, and we'll we'll see you soon. We'll see everybody in in Copenhagen. Hopefully, the Delta variant doesn't disrupt any more of our our travel plans. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.